Have you ever had someone that was impossible to please? But don't be pointing to anybody here this evening. <clears throat> Perhaps it was a parent or a spouse or a boss. And no matter how hard you tried, you just never could do it good enough. Regardless of how good you did, they only pointed out what was wrong or what still needed improvement. I had a boss like that once. I, I was in high school, probably one of the first jobs I ever had. They just got my license. I worked at a convenience store that also had gas pumps out front. And, and my employer's a, an older man that I just could never seem to please. Never one time did I ever hear him say something I did was right. But boy, I heard about it if it wasn't quite what he wanted uh, to turn out. And I just felt that there was just no way I'd ever please this guy. But then I heard through somebody else that when I wasn't around, he said all kinds of good things about my work. Just never to me. The reason that I bring that up, last Sunday we considered passage from 1 Thessalonians 4 under the topic, The Life That Pleases God. And there are some people that believe that in order to please God, you've got to do something really big. You've got to accomplish some great spiritual achievement or have some great spiritual experience. They feel like God is that boss or that spouse or that parent that you could never please. Nothing's ever good enough when it comes to God. I don't think that's true. I don't think that it is impossible to live a life that pleases God. The very first verse we looked at last week in chapter 4, Paul says, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are now living. Paul did not say we're going to put a standard up here that nobody can reach, but that's what you should shoot for. He even commended the Thessalonian Christians, you are doing it. I just want you to keep doing it more. And tonight I'd like to continue in that same theme, the life that pleases God. Look down to verses 9 through 12. Three very simple activities that we can all be involved in that will please God on a day-to-day -day basis. And you don't have to be a scholar, you don't have to be especially gifted. This isn't just for certain members of the church or certain people who hold office. This is for everybody. Every believer can live a life that pleases God. We're going to look first at verses 9 and 10. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God how to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Paul says here the first thing to do in order to have a life that pleases God is to love repeatedly. Not just once. Not like that couple that had been married for 50 years. And the wife says... You just never tell me you love me anymore. And her husband looked over and said, I told you 50 years ago I loved you when we got married, and if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> love is not something that you do one time and it lasts forever. Love is a continued repeating action. Now, most, most, many of you know that in the New Testament Greek, there are different words that are translated love in our English language. The two that are most often used are phileo and agape. Both appear in this passage. Now, when he says about brotherly love, he uses the word Philadelphia. Not the city on the East Coast, but a love for the brothers. It's that word phileo with the Greek word adolphos or 
something, a, a cognitive of that. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Love within a family. Love that you have for your brothers and sisters. Now, the word agape is a word, wasn't used very much outside the New Testament in the first century, but it's used extensively in the scriptures. And it was used as the type of love God shows to us. Unconditional love. Not love because we are something or do something, but if anything, love in spite of the fact of what we are and what we do. Love that is pure. Love that is not based on emotions because emotions can change. But love that is based on an act of the will that says, I will act in love whether you deserve it or not, whether I feel like it or not. That is the kind of love that God has. Now, as Christians, we belong to the same family. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are told repeatedly we should love one another. Jesus told his disciples, that's how the world will know that you're for real if you love each other. And in fact, that was the one element that impressed the Roman world more than anything else. You will even read of unbelievers in the Roman Empire in the first century that would say, my, how those Christians love one another. It was something they weren't used to seeing. It was something that impressed them a great deal. Now, Paul uses the word Philadelphia here, brotherly love. But that shouldn't be seen as falling short of the the ideal agape love. Because in the same verse, he uses that word. He says, in fact, you were taught by God to love one another. And there he uses the word agape. So these words are, in some ways, interchangeable. Uh, Many of you are familiar with the the story of Peter after the resurrection, when Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. And John mixes the words there, phileo and agape. And and a lot of preachers go to great lengths to try to make a big deal out of that. I'm not so sure that it should be. Jesus was not condemning or criticizing Peter at that point. He was reinstating him. And Jesus did not say, sorry, Peter, you used the wrong word. Let's try it again. Every time that Peter replied, I love you, and he was using the word phileo, Jesus responded with a commission, feed my sheep. If he was disappointed in Peter's response, he never showed it. I'm still convinced the reason he asked three times is because that's how many times Peter had denied him. I think that's the significance, not the words that are used. Now, Paul says here that these Thessalonian Christians were, in fact, loving each other as brothers. They were getting along. And he says, you were taught by God to love. Now, this is the only place in the whole New Testament we see this term, taught by God. And it points to an activity of God within our hearts. This isn't something you're going to learn from a preacher behind a pulpit or a teacher at a blackboard or sitting in a home Bible study. This is something that happens on the inside. This is the work of the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts, producing God's kind of love that we extend to others. Now you might say, why do we need to be taught to love? Doesn't that just come naturally? No, it doesn't. It actually goes against the grain of our sin nature. See, we're born with a sin nature, and if you want to not use that word sin because it seems old-fashioned and antiquated, just substitute the word selfish. We're born with a selfish nature. If you don't believe me, go to the family of a, uh, or go to the home of a family who just had a baby. In fact, I failed to mention this this morning. Um, we have a new addition into the Texas Christian Church family. Uh, Zach and Sam Coons had their baby, and um, 
I completely forgot to announce that this morning. Go to their house sometime this week. Oh, maybe around two in the morning. <clears throat> when their little baby boy decides he wants fed or he wants changed, he does not care what time it is. He does not care how long his parents have been working that day and how tired they are. He wants what he wants, and he wants it now, right? That does not change as they get a little older. They just get better at verbalizing it, right? What's the first word every child learns? It is not mama. It is not dada. It is no. <laughs> what is the second word a child learns? Mine, right? How many of you have seen a child throw a tantrum? We all have, right? I mean, you know. How many of you have ever seen a parent teach a child how to throw a tantrum? You don't have to. It comes naturally. Why? Because we're selfish. We want what we want. We're born that way. And we really don't get a whole lot better the older we get. We just get better at hiding it. And even as Christians... We have to be taught and we have to be encouraged to love one another. Because even in a close-knit church family like we have, and we really do, I, I have no complaints with our church family with regards to how we get along, but there's always going to be somebody that's just a little more challenging than others, right? You, you just need a little extra bit of God's grace to really love that person. Somebody once wrote this little poem. I think it puts it very well. To dwell above with saints I love, oh, that will be glory. To dwell below with saints I know, <laughs> now that's another story. And, and it's true. <laughs> there, there are times when eh, it's a little harder. And that's when we need the Spirit of God to teach us, empower us, Show us the way to love one another. Now, again, Paul is not criticizing these Thessalonians here. In fact, if anything, I think he is setting them up as an example. Notice that he says, uh, this is something that you do. The tense here in the Greek gives the impression of this is what you habitually do. This is a habit you have. You have a habit of loving one another. And that only comes as we continue to do it, as we repeatedly extend love, whether we really like that person or not. And yes, it is true. You can love someone you don't really like. You don't have to like them to love them. You don't have to agree with them to love them. We can love from the heart, and we should. And Paul says here, do so more and more. And you know, when this happens in the life of a Christian, when it happens in the life of a church, you are going to see spiritual growth. It, it, you just can't not see growth when love continues to happen. Now, how does God cause our love to increase more and more? I think he does it by putting us in circumstances that force us to practice Christian love. Warren Wiersbe writes, love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. But if our spiritual muscles aren't exercised, the circulation's impaired. The difficulty that we believers have with one another are opportunities for us to grow in love. This explains why Christians who've had the most problems with each other often end up loving each other deeply, much to the amazement of the world. Love repeatedly. Now, the second step in this passage we see in verse 11, live responsibly. Paul writes, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you. Here you see very simply a proper ambition, a proper attitude, and a proper action. The proper ambition is to lead a quiet life. Now, that word ambition was very common. In Paul's day in the Greek world, 
It was a prominent characteristic in their political and their social life. They were a people who always wanted to be first, always wanted to get ahead, to make a name for themselves, to be prominent. I think of the little letter of 3 John, where John the Apostle is is referring to people within the church. And he, he speaks of Diotrephes. And he describes Diotrephes, who loves to be first. Always has to be first. Always has to be foremost. Always has to be prominent. I always said we should have named our dog Ruby Diotrephes, because she has to be first. She always has to be the first one in the door, the first one up the stairs, and she'd better be the first one at the food bowl, or there will be trouble. But there are people that are like that as well. And that's really what the Greek uh, culture personified. Many children have ambitions as they grow up to be a star athlete or or maybe a famous musician or an actor or an actress or, or maybe a wealthy businessman. When I was in grade school, I wanted to grow up to be president of the United States. Not so much anymore. <laughs> now, in the original language, what Paul writes here, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, is really an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. You could render this in the English, make it your ambition to have no ambition. (laughs) But, But really, there's more to it than that. Paul is really writing here, make it your ambition to be calm, collected, peaceful in spirit. Make it your ambition to keep your cool, When things aren't going your way, to be able to take a deep breath, to not react explosively. It's a quality of life. It's it's a quiet disposition. The avoidance of agitated, excitable, and reckless preoccupation with things that mark Christians as out-of-step quacks rather than followers of Christ in step with the Spirit. It's the idea to be able to to kind of go with the flow, not in a way of compromise. I'm not saying we should be like the world, but but more with regard to circumstances. I think one thing I've had to learn throughout the years and growing up is being able to respond when things don't go my way. That's something that happens pretty much on a daily basis. For all of us. We might as well get used to it. I, I've said that if, if I was bringing up a, a small child, if I had a son right now, maybe three years old, one thing that I would do with him is I would say, okay, every day we're going to do one thing that we don't want to do. It might be picking up your toys. It might be cleaning your room. It might be whatever. But I would get him used to the fact that you're not going to be able to do whatever you want to do. There are some times in life you've got to do what needs to be done whether you want to do it or not. It's called being responsible. My parents did a pretty good job of that. I don't know if I was three necessarily, but we always had things we were expected to do. And we didn't have to get paid every time we did them. <laughs> in fact, we didn't even get a special commendation if we did it. We just heard about it if we didn't. <clears throat> Kind of goes back to that idea of being hard to please, but I'm glad my mom's not here yet. Can't preach this next week. You know, one of the quickest ways for a Christian to lose their influence or their testimony, to destroy the good they may have done over the years, is to fly off the handle and tell somebody off. I mean, you may have been working for weeks and weeks and maybe even months and years to build up credibility with a person, to be able to witness to them, and it can be gone in a minute. If we can live responsibly to, to, to lead a quiet life, that's one step in that process. The proper attitude, he mentions, is to mind your own business. Now, this really seemed to be a problem with the Thessalonians. He had to come back in his second letter to them, in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, and say, we hear that some of you are idle. They're not busy, they're busy bodies. And he has to tell them, hey, 
Go with the program here. Mind your own business. They were so busy meddling in other people's matters, they weren't taking care of their own. We might not think this could happen in the church, but it most certainly can. I mentioned earlier that discussion that Jesus had with Peter when he reinstated him into the ministry of the apostles. Well, right at the end of that conversation, Jesus reveals to Peter that one day he's going to be led away and he's going to have to lay down his life for his faith. I'm sure that was hard for Peter to hear. And he turns around and he sees the apostle John some distance behind. And he says, hey, what about him? To which Jesus said, if you really break down the Greek, Peter, mind your own business. That's not your problem. You don't need to worry about that. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. You do your job. You follow me. And it's easy for us to get caught up in that sometimes, about what somebody else is doing. We have to be really careful about this as preachers. Because as preachers, it's very easy to look at other churches, maybe churches that are drawing a little bit more than we are seem to be doing a little better. What's what's happening there? What are they doing? Or we try to compare ourselves with others that are in the similar field that we're in. And you hear that little voice of the Holy Spirit say, Hey, get your mind on your own business. Don't you be worrying about what somebody else is doing. You take care of what you need to take care of, and I'll deal with the rest. It's part of living responsibly. The proper action that we see is in verse 11. Work with your own hands. I think it's very noteworthy. Paul is writing this to a Greek city because the Greeks thought manual labor was just beneath them. They just despised it. They saw it as an occupation fit for slaves. They they wanted other people to do their work. And again, we're going to come back to this in 2 Thessalonians. Paul had to almost bring the hammer down. Say, look, if you're not working, don't eat. Quit expecting other people to support you when you can support yourself. They had gotten caught up in kind of the end times fervor, thinking, what's the use of building something today when the world could end tomorrow? Why waste our energy on temporal things when eternal souls are at risk? And so they were quitting their jobs. They were saying, hey, Jesus is coming soon, so I don't have to go to work. And Paul had to set them straight. He said, work. Do what you need to do to support yourself and your family. And we're not talking about those who want to work and can't because of some physical impairment or disability or even those who are looking for work and haven't found any. I don't think there's any shame for a person who lost their job to draw unemployment benefits. I don't think there's any shame for a person who physically can no longer work to draw disability. I don't think that's a problem. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about able-bodied people who just don't feel like getting up and going to work. There were a lot of them back then. I'm sure there are some in our society today. We need to live responsibly. And you know, it's funny, there was a, <laughs> there was a time in, uh, in my life, uh, I was at a workplace, had only been there a short time, and one of my co-workers was talking to another co-worker, and he pointed at me and said, that guy's a role model. Well, my ears pricked up, because I'm thinking, what in the world is he talking about? He said, he does his job, he keeps his mouth shut, he minds his own business. It wasn't two days later I read this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 and thought, wow, (laughs) that guy didn't know it, but he was quoting scripture. 
And those aren't hard things to do. We're, we're not talking here about rocket science. You don't have to be a scholar that knows everything about the scripture and can answer everybody's questions. You don't have to be the person who never stumbles and falls. You know, the people who don't even walk on the ground, they just kind of hover. We don't need to be that. The steps are very simple. We need to love repeatedly. We need to live responsibly. And finally, verse 12, we need to lead respectfully. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, you will not be dependent upon anybody. Now, it is true on one regard, we are not to live according to how the world views us. We can very easily become man-pleasers at that point. We can compromise our standards. But I think we should keep in mind that the opinion the world has of us, they're going to transfer to our Lord. They don't see Jesus. They can't see God, but they see us. And the impression we give to people when they know we are Christians, is the impression we are giving of our Lord and Savior. And I think we should be mindful of that. I think of the old hit song back in the 80s, I think it was, You Give Love a Bad Name. I wonder how many Christians it could be said, You Give God a Bad Name. People look and say, well, if that's really a Christian, I don't think I want to be one. We need to lead our lives in such a way, not just that people will respect us, but they'll respect our Lord. They will respect our testimony. And I think one of the easiest ways to do that is to follow those steps of of verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands. Just do the right thing. Just just live responsibly. You don't have to live spectacularly. You don't have to perform miracles, or you don't have to pray, preach wonderful sermons or, or pray impressively. Just lead a responsible life. And you'll find that it pleases God. You'll also find that it's a good reflection of God to the world. Truth is, we are being watched, whether you know it or not. People that know that you're a Christian, and I hope that everybody does, they're watching your life. It might be neighbors, it might be co-workers, could be friends, could be members of your family, especially the young ones. They want to know what grandma and grandpa are doing, or what their favorite uncle or aunt are doing, or, or whoever it might be. And if we can impress upon them the life that pleases God, it'll go a long way in our testimony toward them. The life that pleases God is not impossible. I don't even think it's all that complicated. Love repeatedly. Live responsibly. Lead respectfully. That's something any Christian can do. And I believe that shows us A life that pleases God. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you that in your word you have shared with us what you expect of us. How we can live a life that pleases you. You don't keep us in the dark. You don't make us guess. You're not like those who never show us what we should be doing and express appreciation when we do it. I pray that we might take the simple truths that we've learned tonight from your word, that we can put them into practice every day. That we would not only live a life that pleases you, but live a life that attracts others to you. And that we might be able to share with them the good news.